Hello and welcome to Rule Breaker. We are back for our second podcast episode where we have a few great strategy games to talk about and we'll recommend some of the best board game related podcasts for your listening pleasure. Uh, we're also going to go off topic at the end of the episode with another non board games related recommendation. This time it's going to be a book series, uh, one that explores a galactic civilization. I would say no more until the Vortex segment starts out. Uh, so first up, I'd like to talk about a few games uh, that have hit the table at Rule Breaker HQ lately. We've gone for uh, quite a strategy game buzz lately. Uh, three very deep Euro games that rely on a lot of forward planning and timing to get your actions right. Um, we've had a lot of fun with these. They're, they're some of our favourites. Uh, the first one that we got going was Orleans, or Orleans, as other people tend to call it. But um, Orleans is the, uh, the proper name. Uh, this is a very interesting kind of twist on the worker placement formula. Um, it's all about adding specific worker types to your bag. So you've got this kind of um, opaque bag that you drop these tokens in that are like your workers. And um, you're trying to maximize the amount of them in the bag and which ones you're going to draw each turn. Uh, so these workers each have multiple uses on your player board. Um, where you're trying to increase your worker pool, increase your income, um, get a variety of precious goods, um, increase your status with the city's development uh, track, and establish trading posts across the land. It's it's quite involved. It has a lot going on. Um, each player has their own player board. There's also a main board that has multiple tracks on it. Then there's a town hall board that has loads of rewards for when you retire your workers, um, and a large map of the region. It has like connections between canals and roads and that sort of stuff uh, where you place your settlements that contribute towards your final score. The game comes with a, a pile of special action tiles as well that you can research. Uh, so there's a lot of variety and a lot of stuff you can do in the game. Each game is going to feel very different. Uh, it gives you a lot of options each time you play. So the main board has this uh, bunch of tracks that I just mentioned. Uh, you can progress along, which all give you some kind of benefit. One of these allows you to get an extra um, money per turn, but only if you're furthest along it. So when you're playing, you kind of um, you can be far along that track and get an extra money, or you can be towards the the start of it and you'll actually have to pay money if you're the if you're like the worst guy on the track. Um, so when we were playing, I sort of looked at this and figured I'd focus on this, try and get some income, and try and make other people pay. Um, but I also thought that the most important track was the one that allows you to draw more workers from your bag each turn. I figured the more workers you have, the more stuff you can do. Uh, but the more I played the game, I realized that it, it became pretty obvious that each track has its own strengths. There's no real OP track, there's no overpower track, there's no um, clear, obvious one to go on. Um, the technology wheel track was very strong after it originally seeming a little bit weak. Because what that lets you do is it takes these kind of gear pieces. Um, and you can permanently fill one of the spaces on your player board. So um, so it was always filled whenever you needed to use that action space. Um, most action spaces need like three, around mostly about three workers to, to activate them. So reducing that to two was actually really beneficial. Um, I was spending a lot of my time trying to put trading posts down on the map, um, which kind of acts as like a baseline value for your victory total at the end of the game. Uh, this total is multiplied by your standing on the development track, which is something you can fly along very quickly with the right workers taking specific actions. Um, and by timing your choices with collecting the various citizen tokens all over the boards, which are there for all kinds of different actions, um, and being the first one to do specific stuff. Uh, one of the types of workers you can collect is the monk. It's this bright yellow tile. Uh, it has no specific slot on the board because it's a, a wild. Um, like uh, It means it can be placed anywhere. So I kind of liked the idea of the monk, and um, I focused on that for a while. And I think that might have been to my detriment when I was playing. I think I got too many of them. I spent a lot of my time getting these monks, but not actually using them effectively. Um, and I ignored the town hall uh, section quite a lot, which in the end I came out second of the three players playing the game. Um, the leader was fairly far ahead. He'd maxed out the, the development track right to the end and got a big multiplier. He had fewer trading posts than me, but he was still comfortably first thanks to getting a lot of those citizen tiles. Um, yeah, and he he utilized the town hall um, section of the board pretty well. Um, 
But yeah, like when, when playing the game, we figured there's quite a lot of different strategies you can go down. Um, each of us kind of concentrated on one or two key areas. And the guy who went town hall this game did very well. But I think um, there's definitely room for any strategy being being very viable. Um, it's a, Orleans is a fantastic game. Um, despite the sheer mountain of table presence it has, you can bash the game out in about 90 minutes. Um, it's quite simple to understand the basics. Uh, teaching time is quite short as well. There's, there's not a lot to uh, to trip over in the game. There's just a few little specifics that you got to get. There's a few fiddly pieces. Um, mainly the event tiles that flip over at the start of each round. And um, I'd say scoring is probably the main thing. Like the, um, the end of the game, there's a big kind of get your calculator out kind of vague scoring. Um, where it's not always obvious who's going to win. We could kind of tell that the guy who won our game was going to win, but I can imagine that it's not always as easy as that. Um, but yeah, everybody really enjoyed it. Uh, the game is a lot of fun, and it comes highly recommended by the entire gang here at Rule Breaker HQ. So uh, that's early on. Um, yeah, give it a try. So our big game day last week, uh, we, f we followed up early on with a game of Terraforming Mars. This one is a big, big hit with the uh, Rule Breaker Gang. Something we've played about 25, 30 times over the last year. It seems to come to the table most weeks and is a, it's a firm favourite of two of the guys here. Um, we still play the vanilla Terraforming Mars. We don't have either of the expansions. We still get quite a lot of uh, variety out of that. Um, we're playing with the draft variant where you uh, draft cards instead of just getting a hand. And we were using the variable uh, corporations as well, which... I recommend you use pretty much straight away you can probably play one intro game without them but after that definitely recommend using those uh so terraforming mars is part tile placement board game part card game it's a it's a proper hybrid uh, on the table it takes a lot of the best elements of card games and board games and merges them together um players are trying to amass the highest terraforming rating you do this by building cities and greeneries on mars um, by building a tableau of kind of point scoring and production enhancing cards and by being the most kind of um, let's say audacious scientist in the quest to colonize Mars. Uh, the game comes with a uh, comes to a conclusion when players have collectively made Mars habitable for human life. Um, this is done by spending masses of heat to increase the planet's core temperature, by increasing the oxygen percentage to human breathing levels, um, by adding an extensive network of ocean tiles across the surface of Mars. These are the three kind of um, prereqs to um, triggering the end game. The incentive to do all of these is that um, you get TOR, that's a terraforming rating. Um, this is like the game's version of victory points, but also it gives you a base level of income for each turn. So the more you um, improve Mars's habitability, um, the better your income is going to be each turn, which gives you a bit of a boost each turn over the previous turn. Uh, so you're, you're incentivized to do that. Um, you want this income to buy more cards, play those cards into your tableau, um, and use the various standard project actions that are available on the board. Um, and yeah, you're trying to make a working infrastructure on Mars. Players are competing for resources and bonuses on the board. Um, while using strategic card drafting to get the best cards for themselves. But you also kind of want to be denying the most interesting choices for your rivals. Um, the draft format play is a lot of fun this way. It really boosts the game for us. Uh, it kind of turns it from a really good game into a great one. The, um, the tricky, I need this card, but my opponent wants that card that's also in my hand. Which do I take? The one that benefits me or the one that benefits them? Can lead to a lot of interesting choices and um because you're drafting the same time as everybody else there's very little downtime and turns are really quick so uh terraforming mars is a lot of fun that way uh this time out i got a rare win i hardly ever win this game my plan was to ensure that i got uh, lots of heat production uh very early um and then i was focusing on getting two milestones and uh, these milestones give you five points each which can be quite a swing because if you're getting the five somebody else isn't um and then I was gradually increasing my board presence with cities and then slowly started getting some greeneries. Um, this worked out really well for me. I got a kind of a narrow, but not 
that close to victory um, over a guy who was really deeply invested in plants and greeneries. Um, yeah, it was it was a really good. It's always a good game to play. This particular game of it was a lot of fun for me. Finally winning for the first time in quite a while. Um, so that's Terraforming Mars. We really recommend that one. It's one of our absolute favorites here. Um, we've also done a full rules video for Terraforming Mars on the YouTube channel. So if you're new to the game or curious about how it plays, go check it out on Rule Breaker Board Games on YouTube. So it's a really awesome game, Terraforming Mars. We rounded off the big strategy game day with another deep brain burner, uh, Russian Railroads. Uh, this is a deceptively smart game with a, a lot of potential for varying strategies. And this one you're trying to build the most impressive rail network across three kind of linear tracks um, that offer an array of different possible advancements and bonuses. Each track can be built but also upgraded with different colored track types. These track types, um, they score higher and uh, the, the higher the points, they kind of give you more opportunity to improve each track, um, trying to extract as many points as possible each round. Um, different track colors unlock different stuff for you like additional worker pieces or bonus points and that sort of stuff too so you're encouraged to kind of diversify and not just focus on um the, the standard uh, black neutral kind of tracks um the other thing that you need is really powerful locomotives these are these kind of train tiles that you get uh, you get placed on your board um and these require a lot of workers to acquire and upgrade especially if you're trying to do a few of them at once um, each player's rail tracks are also accompanied by this factory track uh, where you increase a points yield each turn but also you have the potential to combo up some special moves with factory tiles and do a whole wealth of other different things. Um, the game's main board is made up of a ton of action spaces that you use your workers on. It's kind of like a normal standard worker placement kind of game like uh, Lords of Waterdeep or Agricola if you're uh, familiar with any of those. Um, and one of the main differences here is that some actions don't just require one worker, some require two or even three to activate them. So you kind of, you've got a pool of like six workers at the start of the game, depending on uh, player count and if you've acquired extra guys or not. Um, but you really have to decide, mm, do I want to spend three on a locomotive and a factory? Do I want to spend two on a space that moves my tracks further than, than normal? Or do I want to just keep using as many one tracks as possible to get lots of different things? Um, aside from just advancing tracks and advancing tracks of different colors, you can also get gold. Um, you can get extra workers temporarily. You can get track doublers, which double the points each round. Um, you can get special actions on engineer tiles um, that are randomly dealt out at the start of each game. Um, and a bunch of other stuff. So what sets this one apart from other Euro worker placement games that um, most players is that most players will score their entire network of tracks and factories after every turn so each turn if you start off early with a haul of points you're going to get those points every single round you're going to score them and score them and score them and score them each round till the end of the game and scoring those each time is is going to be really good for you but um the way this game is designed is that it's actually a very tight balancing act where early leads are really beneficial but if you're clever and you invest heavily in one or two of the big tracks, the four tracks over the course of the game, you can start getting way bigger points each round and catching up and overtaking people who've been chipping away at, at scores each round, each round, each round. Uh, player boards have spaces where you can allocate a bonus tile. Um, usually these are pretty game-changingly powerful things, like these little tokens that you stick down on little circle spots. Um, you tend to not win if you don't get one or two or even three of these things. Um, players tend to push somewhere in one of their tracks where they can acquire these or two of these um, quickly. Um, some of these allow you to rocket along a particular track type, uh, take a super powered locomotive in number nine right at the start of the game, um, or give you an extra worker for the whole game, for example. Uh, there's a whole range of amazing card abilities, your own special engineer with cool action, um, and the choice is always really difficult here. Like you. you you hit one of these spots where you can play one of these little tiles and you're like oh there's so many really good things which one am i gonna do and you probably are gonna regret it no matter which one it is even though they're all great because the other options are also so tempting to take um the game is really tense it's pretty nerve-wracking timing your moves is critical in this game as as critical as it can be in a worker placement game 
any you've played before i guarantee you're going to feel oh just so so much worse when trying to figure out what to take and what to deny others when placing your workers in this game um one day actually a few months ago we cracked open russia railroads for the first time in a good while and we played it three times in a row we really like this game um it's one of rail rule breaker crew's absolute favorite games um don't let the kind of dry boring exterior um put you off because this game is really really entertaining it, it doesn't have the most inspiring um visual style but after a couple of rounds you're going to be hooked you're going to really like it we had a blast this time around um pushing the limits for our best scores as we always try to do uh we actually were more than 100 points off our best score because the game is so close uh this particular time around and uh, yeah it was just really really fun um so russian railroads gets a huge thumbs up from uh, everybody here at rule breaker hq we highly recommend that anyone who likes your games or strategy games give it a look right away um this one is one that we've been trying to figure out in a good way of doing an interesting rules video for uh, in the future on youtube so keep an eye out for that we'll do it at some point this year so that's uh, russian railroads so those three games all pretty good um deep euro strategy games we had a big long day of that it last last week and um, it was it was fantastic one of our favorite types of game and we maximized that day to the absolute top it was great fun and now we'd like to throw some love over to some of the best podcasts in the board game space uh, we're gonna focus on three of the very best today and give a quick nod to some others that you should check out uh, first up, we're going to start with my personal favorite podcast, uh, one that's so much fun to listen to and has been going from strength to strength over the years, and that's the Secret Cabal Gaming Podcast. This is a bi-weekly show about five drinking buddies um, <laughs> from Pennsylvania uh, who love board games. They love them. They are so passionate about what they talk about. Uh, they share their crazy antics. They talk about games they've played. They do this cool news segment um there's always a lot of jibing and poking fun at one another and all that sort of stuff uh jamie keggy is the main host he's a genuinely lovely guy he puts a ton of work into making their show really high quality and um, the production quality is off the charts it's fantastic he does an amazing job on that well done jamie uh the other four main hosts the founders as they're known um are chris brian tony and steve they all have very different very distinct personalities you can after a while kind of tell what types of games each of them like and chances are if you um identify your taste similar to one of these guys you're going to be able to take their recommendations on board regularly um yeah they're very opinionated and you're gonna you're gonna have a lot of fun getting to know them over over the course of your listens of the podcast uh the show is so popular that they've expanded to multiple different shows they do two rpg shows now lords of the dungeon and the Dungeon Master's Ludus. Uh, not being a big RPG gamer myself, I haven't listened to a lot of these, but the one, the few episodes I did listen to, I enjoyed, even though I, I don't really play RPGs. Uh, they do an express episode once a month too, which is like a single topic, a shorter episode that's also a lot of fun, and they usually have a couple of guests on that episode. Uh, these guys are hilarious. They're an inspiration to us here at Roadbreaker um one of our favorites they're my personal favorite for sure um and as we record today they're actually running their big fundraiser on kickstarter for their new season um i highly recommend you uh give them a listen the yeah search for secret cabal on kickstarter and you'll find it there um if you're already a fan of theirs show them some support give them some love um or if you're new to board games or the hobby and you're just listening to podcasts for the first time give them a look and if you enjoy what you hear suggest giving them a few quid give them a few bucks keep their amazing content flowing that's the secret cabal gaming podcast amazing stuff um our second recommendation is easily the biggest and most successful podcast in board game space that's the dice tower uh the king of the nerds tom vassal and the man with the golden voice eric summer hosts the main show um in the network they do podcasts every week, alternating between an audio podcast and a video podcast. They've made the unusual decision to share their audio show with a completely separate pair of hosts on the weeks where they do their video show. Um, so every second week you're going to have different hosts on that, not those guys. 
and the show has been on the air for over 10 years 10 years can you believe that it's an incredible um, amount of work has been put into this show uh, the Dice Tower is a very prolific YouTube show also, hundreds of videos a year, uh, they do game reviews, opinion pieces, variety shows, um, and of course they're most popular, the top tens. Uh, Tom is joined by two guys, Sam Healy and Z Garcia, on most of the video episodes. Um, they do they have a lot of joking going on, a lot of arguing going on, all in good fun. Uh, the show tends to lean towards newer games on the market, but caters for all tasting games. As well as in-depth dives into like board game industry news and business side of things and convention coverage and all that sort of stuff. Uh, the podcast is expertly produced and it has a lot of heart and it comes highly recommended from everybody here at Roadbreaker. So that's the Dice Tower. The last of the three we're going to focus on today is Ludology. Um, this is something a bit different uh, to the usual podcast where it's it's a bit more a bit more thinky. Um, Jeff Engelstein and Gil Hover are the current hosts. Um, Jeff has had previous hosts before. Mike Fitzgerald and Ryan Sturm have each been in the seat with him. Um, all, all of these guys have been great. Uh, each episode they kind of take one area of games and discuss it in detail. Uh, the show has a more academic or analytical nature to it. Um, it focuses a lot on theory and design principles. Uh, they tend to back up a lot of what they talk about with scientific evidence or um, statistical um, evidence to prove what they're what they're on about. Uh, the aim of the show seems to be to kind of educate people um, as much as it entertains. And they've done over 170 episodes over five years. Again, very prolific work. Um, Jeff and the various co-hosts have covered just about every board game mechanism in detail, one per episode. Um, but they also focus on higher level topics. They're really good at giving tips for aspiring designers and lots of related discussion on similar top topics. They talk a little bit about video games, sometimes about psychology, social experiments, mathematics, that sort of uh, ancillary stuff. Uh, it's a very, very clever show, but it never feels like it's a lecture. Uh, it always leaves you with more knowledge than when you went in. A lot of the principles of game design that were covered in the early episodes of this one really helped me when I was studying and restudying game design to get my job in video game design where I am now and I would recommend any aspiring designer to uh, pick it up from episode one and just listen to the whole thing. Neology is highly, highly recommended. Another great show. So there's plenty of other great podcasts out there. Uh, three we've mentioned, The Secret Cabal, The Dice Star and Neology, they're just the cream of the crop. You'll find lots to listen to in Flip the Table, Shut Up and Sit Down, Rado Talks Through, Heavy Cardboard, and the YouTube show Man vs. Meeple, amongst others. So yeah, check those out. Now it's time to go back into the Vortex where we talk about something a little different uh, to close out the show each, uh, each episode. Um, we're going to briefly go off topic from board games to highlight or discuss something in geek culture. Usually it's movies, TV, books, video games, something like that. Um, it's called the Vortex because there's so much pop culture stuff these days out there that it's really hard to keep track of it all. And what we'd just like to do here is give the odd recommendation, something that we think you might enjoy as board game fans. Today we're going to talk about a book series, one of my absolute favourites, and that is the Culture Series by Ian M. Banks. Uh, Banks wrote 10 books in the Culture Series over a span of about 25 years. Uh, while he was also spending his time writing literary fiction, which we also recommend. Uh, the culture is a, this massive scale civilization spanning many star systems and ships where starship AIs called Minds are the highest authority. And what they do is they kind of govern uh, the civilization. Um, they provide a life of pleasure and luxury for billions of citizens under their governance. Um, they're also very humorous. Uh, they name themselves crazy eccentric things. Uh, like really long sentences and, and tricky uh, to pronounce stuff. Um, <laughs> they communicate with a mix of sarcasm um, and, you know, uh, they're very stern a lot of the times. Uh, but if they spot a lot of danger or they're worried about something, um, you can tell, even though they're robotic computer things, that they're, they're in, under a lot of panic, even though they're not sounding that way. It's very well written how he does it. Um, the main species of the culture appears to be humanity, um, but it becomes clear after you read a couple of the books that it's not humans from Earth. It's like humans are like this base body that exists across multiple different planets. Um, the 
culture citizens have the ability to change their body features, their gender, their roles in society, all kinds of physical, mental attributes, pretty much anything about themselves with simple procedures. Um, they're hugely privileged and um, basically they're immortal. They can back themselves up and be put into a new body when they die. So there's a, there's a lot of complex um, social stuff going on with those dudes. Um, the series itself starts with Consider Phlebas. This focuses on... Um, it's not, it doesn't really focus on the culture, actually. It focuses on the Iterans, who are these guys at war with them. As culture novels go, it's a bit of an outlier in that way. Um, the culture is more of the antagonist than the uh, the focus of the story. So Phlebas is a really good book, uh, but it's no means the best in the series, at least in our opinion. We reckon... Well, I certainly do. The rest of the guys probably haven't read this one. That, um... The second book in the series, Player Games, is the best. Uh, the Player Games focuses on, focuses on a guy called Jerno Gerge. He's like this master games player. Um, and games, in this case, is mainly board games and video games. Um, the plot of this one, he's asked by the culture to make first contact with this really militaristic species who play this game called Azad. Um, and the way they play it is they play it as a kind of a societal thing where they base the structure of their next cycle of government on the results of the game um without going into too much detail on it because it's, we can easily spoil this one um i'd say it's it's a really fascinating book if you like board games you're gonna find it really interesting as well because of the the nature of the complex game they play and the effect that it has on people is pretty awesome so we recommend you actually start reading that one that's the player of games Another high point in the series is Use of Weapons. This is the third book in the series. It uh, has an absolute mind-bender of a sequence uh, towards the end of the book. It's one of the most brilliant pieces of plot writing I've ever read. Um, it's fantastic. The, uh, the Culture series has a wide cast of characters, most of whom stay contained to their own individual books. The stories do get pretty dark towards the end of the sequence with uh, surface detail. In particular, there's one about this digital hellscape where people can be forced to go when, when they have body death. Um, and the Xilts destruction or impending destruction in the Hydrogen Sonata is also fairly heavy going. Um, but each book's worth a read. There's a lot of humour, but very few weak entries in the series. You're gonna, if you love one of these books, you're probably going to like all of them. Um, other highlights in the series for us include Look to Windward, which is a, sort of a sequel to Consider Phlebas, but from the culture viewpoint, and uh, Inversions, which uh, flips the whole story on its head by starting out in a pre-space frame society. It's really interesting. So uh, give the books a try. Player of Games by Ian M. Banks is our top recommendation for starting out, but you can't really go wrong starting anywhere in that series. It's absolutely fantastic. So check it out. That takes us to the end of our second episode. I hope you enjoyed listening along. And if you have, like to jump into the comment section of the video and suggest your own favorite board game podcasts or strategy games. We'd love to know what you've played recently and if you recommend it. Um, feel free to subscribe to Rule Breaker on YouTube. That's where we do most of our content. Um, next time, we're going to talk about our top 10 cooperative games. And we're going to run through a couple of recently played games that we've been holding off on for talking about for a while some really really interesting stuff um and then we'd like to talk about video game recommendation in the vortex segment so until then this is rule breaker signing off thank you and goodbye